Uh, thanks for coming. Um, this is a talk about data types in PostgreSQL. It's referred to as a guided tour. Uh, there are a few hundred data types in Postgres. I will do my best not to make this a three-hour tour. Um, please feel free to ask questions, um, but I will have to keep things moving at a fair clip, and so there's not a ton of detail in here. Um, are you going to try and get my house mic working here? It says it's unmuted. It's on me. Science. Mic check, mic check. I can hear the house coming up a little bit there. Or was it just turned all the way down? Oh, okay. Yeah, great. I can, I'm loud enough. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're recording. Oh, you're also recording separately? I have a separate mic. Oh, oh, fancy. Well, good thing I've only done preamble then. All right, house mic check, mic check. Oh, uh, fancy. All right. Okay, so if anybody uh, was deaf in the back, um, my name is Peter Van Hardenberg. This is Data Types in Postgres. Uh, we're going to be mostly talking about the sort of far reaches of the Postgres data type universe, but we'll cover a little bit of the basics along the way. Um, I work for Heroku. Uh, we offer a product called Heroku Postgres. Um, we run a lot of Postgres databases for a lot of websites. So I'm going to say a lot of these things are things that we've learned either by building and operating large-scale web services ourselves or by working with our customers who do the same thing. But our focus is really in the web application OLTP space. So it's possible that I may say some things that are not accurate for people running data warehouses. Uh, if I say anything that's wildly out of whack and you're in the data warehouse space and you notice, feel free to correct for the record. Um, the slides are online at postgresdatatypes.pvh.ca. I will continue to update them with documentation references or if anybody finds the corrections, I'll put them in there. So feel free to bookmark that and come back to it if that's the kind of thing you like. Okay, so we're gonna look at some basic types. I'm gonna give an incredibly high level uh, explanation of what a data type is and how it works. Then we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the advanced data types. We'll go into some more niche stuff. We'll talk about how you can build your own types. Then we're gonna look at some community extensions. And then I'm gonna sort of do my usual uh, call for new types uh, in the hope that somebody goes away inspired. Um, a theme of some of this talk is that uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, so in general, I will be oriented towards having nicer queries to read, um, avoiding operational problems, as well as trying to maintain performance. I'm not terribly concerned about third normal form or other kinds of abstract notions of uh, database design. Most of this stuff is the sort of like uh, earned through pain uh, or just I prefer to model things this way because it's more intuitive to me or to other developers I've worked with. Um, you're welcome to not use these types if you don't like them, but you're here. so. Apparently you're curious. So hopefully we will not be able to go into great depth on all the types, but I wanna leave you with at least some sense of what is there and roughly how it works and why and when you might wanna use it. Okay, so before we get into the weird and wonderful, I wanna cover some real basics because although most of the people here at PGCon will not make these mistakes, these are things that I see in the field a lot. Um, I'm gonna use just a simple user's row as sort of inspiration to uh, reference this. This is what your user's row should look like. Uh, I'll call attention to things in more detail. One thing I don't have a slide for is delete it at. It's a common uh, mistake that people make, which is to delete data from their database. Uh, if you're building web applications, you usually don't want to do that for a whole variety of reasons, so uh, it's very common to just have a deleted at uh, column there anyway. Uh, in general, uh, I will say you should always have a primary key uh, a surrogate key that is a big serial. Um, my experience has been that when I've tried to create tables that didn't have that surrogate key, I always regretted it. You can also use a UUID. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about big serial. So big serial is a very large integer. Um, most people will default to serial by sort of habit. Uh, if it is smaller in some cases to use serial instead of big serial, 
but if you have a table that's small enough that you don't need big serial, probably it doesn't really matter that you're spending a few extra bytes per row. And if you have a table that's big enough to need big serial, then you're going to wish you had it from the beginning. So you know, one of the themes here is just building good habits, right? Like, sure, if there's a time when you do some benchmarking, you're like, boy, I really wish I had a regular serial instead, great, go for it. If you're doing schema design and you know better, great, go for it. In general, I encourage you to have big serial as your default sort of when you go to put uh, a, a primary key on a table. Um, UUIDs are good as well. Uh, UUIDs are even larger than big serial, but they have some very desirable properties. Uh, one of the most desirable properties of a UUID is that you can generate it uh, in the client. And so when you have really large scale applications where you have a lot of different processes generating things all the time, you don't have to worry about contention for serials. You don't have to re-architect your application once you start to shard your data out. You just generate UUIDs either in the database as you need them or in the clients where you make them. Uh, most people use a random UUID. You can do more intelligent things to try and maintain sort order in your indexes. But again, if you are at that stage, you can probably afford to spend some time going into more depth on this. I'm just going to try and move through there. Uh, I see people using varchar. Um, like with lengths on it, because they have habits from other databases they've been in, uh, don't. Uh, unless, again, you know you need to. But in general, uh, text is going to be faster, and text is what you actually want in most cases. If your data is large, it's going to get toasted out, and we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, if you create B-tree indexes on text, not only can you search equality, you can also do prefix matching, which is great. We're going to come back to this a little bit as a theme. You can also do this one great trick, which is if you create a functional index on the reverse of a string, you can do suffix matching. Uh, this is a good trick if you have email addresses you need to look up a lot. I think this is dumb uh, because it's one of those like clever tricks people learn rather than something that's obvious. Um, but when you need to look up email addresses by domain, if you don't have the email type we talk about later, this is a handy trick to keeping your hat. Uh, you may also want to think about regular expressions, and if you add a gin index with PG trigram, many regular expressions can actually take advantage of that index. And of course, hopefully you went to the full text search and are well familiar with that. Uh, Timestamp TZ, 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 we're north of the border. Um, Again, the, the SQL standard is a terrible wasteland of bad decisions. And uh, the fact that timestamps don't have time zones by default is probably a, a legacy of something that was important in the 1970s. But today, just train yourself. Always type timestamp TZ. Uh, you also obviously don't want time. You may want a date. Uh, again, this is just sort of on the theme of noting some functions. How many people use date trunk? OK, so this is worth going into briefly. Uh, date trunk is a really handy thing if you have queries that run regularly, like analytic queries, you know, the kind of like monthly query. A lot of people will put like a date literal into their query, and then the next month when you come back and run the query again, you have to go and edit that in like four places. Uh, if you date trunk and then say month, week, or year, or whatever your interval is, and then now, this is a really nice idiom, because when you come back and run the query next month, It'll always snap to the beginning of the month and run from there. If you want the previous month, you do this, but you add a minus one month interval uh, before you do the date trunk. So now minus one month, date trunk month, will take you to the first day of the month last month. So uh, this is just sort of my collection of little tricks. So you can also group on date trunk. Uh, so if you wanted to sort of group up all the things that happened in a day. And so intervals are helpful. You can subtract those. It, people are familiar with intervals? Oh, good. This is I'm glad that I'm doing this then. Um, you can also, sorry, uh, use them with generate series, which is another trick I do a lot. So again, when you're building kind of a analytical queries, you may want to say, you know, what were, how many people signed up each day last month? Uh, if you just group on days of the month, of course, you'll have gaps anywhere that there was no data, which is annoying for rendering or other reasons. Uh, so you join against a generate series of the days of the month. Okay. Uh, don't use bits or bit strings. Um, they're not what you want, almost certainly. Just use bools. They work how you'd expect. Um, don't index your booleans. They only have two values and a B tree index that only has 
two values is problematic. Uh, again, you know, wherever you find advice in data land, someone's going to have specific advice where that's not the case. You may want to do a partial index on a Boolean field um, if, for example, you're looking for a, to index a small number of users that have some properties on that. Quinn? Oh, yes, make your Boolean fields not null, says Quinn for the record. So, uh, yes. Uh, if you are storing binary data, use byte A. You should also think about whether or not you should be storing that data in Postgres or in S3 or somewhere else. Um, mostly, there aren't too many functions or operators that you need to know about to work with byte A. I mean, there's substring, but again, you mostly, if you're storing binary data in your database, you're just putting in and taking it out. It is handy to know you can get MD5 sums of your byte A from time to time. Uh, PG Crypto has a whole bunch of other stuff you can use uh, if you want to do other kinds of checksums and so on. Um, that's helpful. Uh, that's kind of it for my like high level advice of common mistakes I see people doing on the real basic stuff. Um, but I want to call attention to a few data types that I don't want you to use. Don't use money. It's not very good. Um, it's, it was, I mean, I, <laughs> money is the root of all evil, yes. Uh, but in this case, it's just, uh, it's from an era long ago in Postgres land and hasn't really been updated and brought up to the standards of sort of what would be expected of a core data type today in Postgres. Uh, and what it mainly gives you is sort of locale-based formatting. But of course, that can lead to all kinds of difficult problems with localization and other things. My advice, uh, and the advice you'll get from anybody else, is use a numeric instead for your money. Uh, you may consider doing integer-based sense instead. Um, again, don't use timestamp. I see people occasionally get confused and post things like, I have a time column. It's doing weird things. That's because you actually wanted a timestamp. Use big serial. Also, in general, you know, whenever you're looking at types, probably don't want float or integer. You, numeric is probably actually what you want. Uh, again, there are reasons why for performance you may want to prefer that, but usually numeric is, is where you want to go. Um, I already mentioned bit string. Also, before you use XML, you may have XML, but consider just storing it as text. If you're using the XML type and you're not actually processing that XML in the database, uh, you know, consider only casting it to the XML type when you want to work with it. LibXML is the source of a lot of security problems. It's a source of crashes. It's a big complicated library that is, uh, I hesitate to, say it's poorly written, hesitate to say it's poorly written because I haven't read it myself, but over the years running a large fleet of databases, we've seen a lot of problems with libxml. So uh, certainly I would advise against using the XML type if you have the option. Okay, I'm gonna talk briefly about what a type is in Postgres. The uh, facile answer is that it is a row in PG type. Um, and indeed, you can see all the types in the database by querying the PG type table. Uh, so basically, what a type really is is a nice name, uh, a couple of functions that define how a text representation of that type is converted to an internal data structure and back, uh, and then a set of uh, operators and functions that can work on that type. There are a few other things, alignment, size, and so on, that uh, unless you're implementing a type in C, you probably don't need to think about too much, or if you're really working on performance. But at a high level, that's what a type is. And so what happens when you uh, create, say, a numeric is you take a string, say 3.14, it gets passed to numeric underscore in. Numeric underscore in then parses that value, does whatever it needs to, and then creates a data structure that gets returned, and then Postgres packs that into the tuple. Then that gets written out to the page, it's written to disk, when you load a tuple, that pipeline kind of works back the other way. There's also uh, the send and underscore receive functions for binary data. Uh, I don't have those next, sorry, that's later. Um, but uh, that's for the binary pro wire protocol. That can be a great efficiency boost, but it also means that whatever language you're working in needs to have a client driver that knows how to speak that data type, which means that uh, oftentimes for sort of extension data types, you may not have support for that in the drivers you're using. Data structures are either fixed size or variable length. Um, fixed size variables, integer, UUID, point, some of the geometry types. Uh, those are nice because they can be packed quite efficiently and they tend to be very fast. Most data types that people use tend to be variable length. The variable length ones, such as text, for example, 
It's a, a four byte length number and then just the data. Uh, and the nice thing about the var lena is that it can be toasted out. And the, the way Postgres basically avoids the problem that like SQLite or I don't know what MySQL does for storage these days, but historically back in the day when I used to use MySQL, you had to think about how big your var chars were because they took up that much space in every record. Uh, in Postgres, if you have a large value, it will be taken out of the record and stored out of line in a separate table called a toast table and usually also compressed on top of that. Toast is great, um, not only in general when you're looking through a table, if you have a very large value like that, you don't really care what's in the value. So when you're searching a table to say sum up a particular feature or to look for a particular ID, it's nice if you don't have to actually pull all the IO for all that data that you will only need for a small number of the rows that you eventually send back. In addition, because it's stored compressed, you save even more. So if you do a full scan, you actually are spending less of your most precious resource, which is IO. I think theoretically you could end up losing if you had sort of a worst case scenario where you were reading all the data and joining it back to all the records and then looking at the contents of the data. But I'm not actually sure if, and I suppose if it also couldn't compress or you had like bad compression. But practically speaking, toast is always a win and that's why it's on by default. Try and avoid um, parsing the contents of all the data in very large tables. And if you're going to uh, look inside the data of a very large table, you should probably consider doing a full text search. Um, or you may want to add a gin index on JSONB structure, so on. Uh, those things can help improve performance quite a bit. I already talked about binary protocol. OK. Yes. Yes, so the question was, when should you uh, store larger values in your database versus in an external source like S3? Um, uh, broadly, I guess it kind of depends on your application architecture. Uh, Toast is great in the sense that it basically reduces the penalty for doing that, but it means that anytime you get those values, you're doing a database call. So a good example would be like a thumbnail of an image. Well, sure, you can put it in your database, but it means that every time you want to serve up that image, Someone's going to come in, they're going to hit your API, the API is going to pull that thing from the database, and then it's going to make its way back out. That's a sign that you might not have a sort of ideal access pattern for storing those assets in the database. Um, in that case, S3 is nice because you can just stick it up there. There's all the internet infrastructure to you know, put CloudFront or whatever in front of it, and you can edge cache it to the user. So basically, if the idea that the thing is being served out of the database seems like a waste of resources, then probably avoid doing that. But if it's like the contents of a blog post or something like that where you may need to munge it or you may want to search it or other things like that, keep it in the database. Um, I'll confess that there have been plenty of times when I've been lazy and just said like, oh, I only have a few images that users upload. Like, it's fine. You know, this is not a high traffic site. So again, you know, premature optimization being the root of all evil. My advice is broadly like do what feels reasonable and comfortable for an app that doesn't do a lot of traffic. Um, I know that that's maybe an unpopular opinion, but you can always optimize it later, whereas if you spend all your time optimizing things that you don't need to do, then later when you have real problems, now you have to fix them. Um, okay, well let's talk about some of the actual cool data types in Postgres. We're gonna start with arrays. How many people are using an array in a schema right now? Okay, most people, that's great. Um, I don't really need to explain what an array is. It's an array and a value. It's fine, it's not rocket science. Uh, when, when would you use arrays? Um, we use arrays a lot for you know, actual array data. Uh, obviously modeling arrays in a relation where you have sort of a, you know, a foreign key and then an integer offset and then you join that back and then you, it's kind of a mess and it's not very fun. It's also really slow to work that way. Storing data in an array inline in your table is uh, faster for performance reasons. It's easier to reason about. But we also use arrays to uh, represent things like tags. So if you have like posts that may have tags on them or you know, records, users, that's really handy because if you put a gin index on it, you can query very quickly over that. Uh, and it's nicely sort of free form. Um, I also use arrays a lot for sort of on the fly aggregation. You know, you're pulling a bunch of things out of the database. You can use array ag and put a bunch of results so you get everything back in one row. And that can be helpful for both analysis and also for improving web performance. It, please. Is there an advantage for using arrays over JSON? So 
an array is a typed structure. Um, so an array, you can have n-dimensional arrays, but mostly I haven't seen people use those too much. It's usually just one-dimensional arrays. Um, it's, arrays can store any data type, so you can put a whole row in it. JSON only supports, obviously, the types that JSON has. And an array of uh, fixed size data will also be faster because it doesn't have to do all the JSON mechanism. Arrays, of course, don't have the full sort of structure uh, stuff that JSON can do. So again, it, it's kind of like, when does it feel natural to use an array? Um, JSON also can be kind of complicated to work with. So like if all you're ever doing is like in the case of tags, you know, you just want to know is the tag free user on this record? It's handy not to have to think about all the, should I use JSON or JSONB and the overhead of all that. An array is, is a nice simple mental model as well as an efficient computational one. We'll talk more about JSON. Here's some array syntax examples for those who haven't worked with it before. You can make arrays a few different ways. You can use the concatenation operator to extend it. Um, you can create them through aggregations. Uh, when you're accessing them, remember that SQL is uh, the odd language out here and has a one indexed array. It's sort of like European uh, floor numbers uh, where uh, the, I guess, ground level is zeroth and here it's, this is the first floor. Um, the containment operator there is the at sign uh, greater than um, and you can actually, if you have a gin index on a column that has array data in it, you can pull out data very quickly. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, I thought I had that example, didn't I? So yes, you can also use the unnest function. So if you have data in an array and you call unnest on it, it will sort of pivot that to the side and then you get back a, a row for each element of the array. So JSON doesn't really qualify as an overlooked data type. Um, I know it's got a lot of hype. Oleg described it this way. He said, we made a database inside a type. Uh, I wasn't sure if this was a good thing or a bad thing from the way he was saying it. I'm actually a little bit ambivalent about this. this Postgres is really poor at hierarchical data, but it is increasingly weird to me how much functionality is specific to this type. I imagine someday that will be reconciled. There are lots of reasons to use JSON. I often will just put a column on a table called atters and then put stuff in it that I don't want to think about doing a migration for. So, uh, you know, especially for like maintenance and operational stuff where, you know, something is down and you need to flag some records one way or another. I just use that adders column and I'll stick a flag in there like migrated at or restored by or whatever you need. It's nice to have that kind of unstructured place to just throw some data. Um, I have seen so many talks uh, of people complaining about people doing this that I should um, say that if you do this, if, you, if one of those uh, fields becomes long lived, you should move it into a column. Uh, hierarchical data, of course, uh, you can technically model in SQL using uh, recursive queries, but both from a sort of performance perspective, the SQL's not super good at that, and then also from a reading hierarchical queries perspective, uh, they're not terribly legible, and then actually building a hierarchical query into a JSON result set is kind of tricky to do well, and then you start writing PL SQL, and then PL SQL is really slow, so, you know, if you have hierarchical data, especially if it's already JSON, you may as well keep it in a JSON column. Those are kind of my top uh, use cases, sort of free, free form or semi-structured data, actual hierarchical or document data, and data that's JSON already and you just don't want to screw with it. Um, should you use JSON or JSONB? You should use JSONB. Uh, there's a lot of people who claim a lot of nuance on this. Oh, you should use JSON for this or JSONB for that. You should probably use JSONB. The B is for better. <laughs> uh, if you use JSONB, it gets parsed once when you put it in the database. Then you can put a gin index on it. You can query for document structure. Uh, it takes less space usually when you store it. What you lose is the white space formatting because the JSON type, the older one of the two, which was still a huge improvement, um, over just using text columns. It confirms that the uh, incoming data is JSON, but it stores it as the original text, and then whenever you want to operate on it, it has to reparse it. Whereas the JSONB 
because it basically breaks the JSON down into a binary form, it, it can be much more efficiently stored and more efficiently queried. Um, also, you almost always want a gin index on your JSON. Again, uh, there are reasons why you might not want one, but if you have a JSON, lots of JSON in your database and you want to be able to work with it, you probably want a gin index on there. Uh, this is for Christoph. Uh, don't do this, which is to just create a table uh, that is just an ID and a JSON, um, especially if the contents of that table really just look like a relation. You're really just poking Postgres in the eye and blinding it and keeping it from doing what it does best. Uh, also, you're going to have complicated queries. Uh, you know, it's, I know there are times that people will do this anyway, like if you just need to store a bunch of JSON documents, but you know, think a little bit about whether or not some of those things really should be columns. Okay, I've done the like, um, grumpy person part. Um, if you're building JSON, are, are people using JSON? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, and, and this is the thing. You're going to forget the B. You're going to forget the B a lot. I forgot the B about 50 times just making these slides. Make the B, and this is part of why I think it's important to form a habit here. Always put the B after the N. You'll know that you're getting it right when you go to type JSON somewhere else and you put a B after it. Because every function, right, the column name, everything has a JSON and a JSON B form. And if you leave the B off, Postgres will call the other form. And because the two types can be cast between each other, you'll take the JSON B, you'll cast it to a JSON, then you'll operate on it. So you end up basically getting the worst of all worlds. So just make it a habit. Always put the B in there. I mean, you could consider maybe, I don't know, you could possibly drop the JSON type from your database. I haven't thought about that, and I'm just thinking out loud here. I shouldn't do that in a talk. Um, you can create a shortcut type. Create a shortcut type? Yeah, and would that mask the underlying type, do you think? Yeah, I mean, that so, code is the JJJ. Oh, okay. So someone suggests that you create a shortcut type called JJJ, which is not similar. Um, I'd have to think about whether that's a good idea more. Maybe do that. Try it, and if you like it, tweet at me. Um, so you can add, so creating an input, you just give it JSON, cast it to JSONB. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you want to append, again, the concatenation operator uh, works fine, just like with arrays. To dig into JSON, you use the arrow operator. Um, so one arrow says drill into the JSON. Two arrows says cast it back. So uh, this is because JSON a JSON string, as you can see here, like Ottawa, has to have quotes around it. So as you're drilling down through the members of JSON, until you get to the end, you want to have just a single stabby. And when you get to the end of whatever query you're writing, you need a double stabby to get back the data type you want. Does that make sense? So if you go in, uh, if you go in with a single stab to a Boolean, you'll get back a JSON type called true, for example. But what you probably want is actually the Boolean value, value true. So that's what the, sec the extra little arrow on the end does there. Uh, you can also pass a whole path in at once. That's the last example there. Um, it's not quite as pretty, but uh, it should perform better. And then in this case, I have the extract path text, so it will return the text of whatever the result of that is. So there are lots of different forms of these, and you should uh, go and look at them, but I'm just trying to give sort of an intuitive sense of what kinds of things exist. And of course, there are lots of functions that will allow you to decompose JSON into something more uh, relational-y, uh, such as select, oh look, I have a JSON without a B. Um, select JSON to record set. So in this case here, we're taking this and we're actually returning it as records, um, which is helpful. Again, um, with the gin index here, same thing we're doing with the array in the second case. So you can pull out a sub-document and say, you know, I want to find talks where this was previously presented at PGCon, or in the first case, you just use the question mark which says, does this document have a key at the top level, which is previous presentation. Uh, and with the gin index, these are very fast. Any JSON-B questions before I move on, or JSON? Okay, now we're doing it for time. Okay, we're getting there. So enums, uh, enums are, a bit like a restricted domain. You can just basically, it's just like an enum in any language, honestly. You just take words, you map them to integers, 
Uh, it means they store efficiently, which can be handy. Uh, the data will live in PG enum. This is good if you have a whole bunch of the same label. So like we have a table of states of, that a database could be in for our monitoring service. And by using an enum instead of a state name, you can compress that down quite a bit, and it's faster. Um, it also then guards you against inserting data you may not be allowed to insert. Once you have an enum, uh, you can create them like this. You can treat them like they're text values for most purposes, but it will block you from inserting things you're not allowed to insert. Uh, you can alter an enum to add more values to it. It's worth noting that internally enums basically are integers, like in C or many other languages. So you can say greater than or less than, but please don't do that. That's you're only asking yourself for pain later when someone changes the enums. Enums are implemented as floats, apparently. I didn't know that. That's very sad. Oh, so you can put values in between. OK. Um, sure. Why not? Uh, I don't know that that's a good idea, but that's interesting. OK, so uh, moving on from this stuff is sort of stuff you've seen in other databases. Ranges are a, a Jeff Davis joint. Um, this is a, a wonderful data type that I have come to rely on all the time. A range is when you basically, I mean, it's sort of the name implies what it does. You have a lower end and an upper bound. And then there are a bunch of operators for it. Why would you use ranges? Nothing lasts forever, right? Like, usually ranges are time-based. And they give you a bunch of operators that work on ranges. So you can say, overlap these ranges, intersect them. You can add exclusion constraints that I'll show an example of. And then because you can index ranges using uh, gist indexes, it can also make things very fast. Um, there are some pre-built range types. There's numeric range, timestamp time with time zone range, and date range. Um, this is how you create one. Uh, if you have null in a range, it counts as either positive or negative infinity. So a range that goes from now, comma, null is from now until forever. Null, comma, null is all of time. Um, if you want to see, for example, who your users with active accounts on Christmas Day were, you can just create a range and then intersect it against that timestamp. Uh, technically, this is not all of Christmas Day. This is just intersecting against uh, the instant of uh, the beginning of Christmas. Um, and I mentioned the indexing. Now, actually, I'm going to call attention to one technique here, which is uh, we're actually just casting two ranges when we need to use them. A lot of these data types are great if you're storing your data in that format, but it can also be useful even if you're just casting to that form as you need it. So in this case, we're creating a functional gist index using two columns. And whenever you then use that, whenever you create an instance of that range in the future, Postgres will be able to use that. That's really handy because it's much easier to convince people to allow you to create an index and then to update some of your queries versus necessarily rewriting all of uh, the things that may be using that table to understand ranges, particularly since ranges are very much a Postgresism and may not be supported by all drivers in all languages. Uh, ranges work great with window functions. I do this kind of thing a lot. So here we're basically partitioning on ranges, and then we're finding all of the events that uh, intersected the last four hours. Um, and again, window functions are kind of hard to read, but I'm going to have to keep moving. The slides are online. Um, the exclusion constraints look like this. So in this case, we're creating a reservation table, and we're saying you can't ever create a situation where uh, you have a record where the rooms are equal and the booking times overlap, which is a really nice uh, feature. OK, um, I'm going to talk about a few extensions. I mentioned email addresses earlier. I've written this query a lot of times to try and figure out um, customers. So you have the full table scan. We did the reverse index type. We create a functional index on the reverse of that email field. And then we query on the reverse of that. This is a little bit uh, goofy, and it works. But you know, how many people already knew about that trick? Right, exactly. How many people have an email address in their database that might need to query? Yeah. Um, so I'll be honest. I actually wrote this talk because Peter Eisentrout um, replied to a tweet where I was complaining about the lack of an email address type, uh, and then replied with this type, and it's wonderful. Uh, so in this case, you have user and host functions. Uh, the email address gets stored in domain user order, so the index uh, by default will cluster together users with the same uh, email address. 
uh, it's quite a bit faster than doing things yourself and it's quite a bit simpler and it will only get better over time. It does not, helpfully, it does not implement the email uh, RFC. It just checks that the thing you claim is an email has an at sign and it has uh, only characters that are mostly email friendly and that it's not too long. Um, how about URLs? Uh, he then built URL types in response to another tweet um, a year later. I shouldn't tweet more often, nobody wants that. Uh, in this case here, we can have URLs stored and now instead of doing stupid regular expression things all the time, you can have a function that will extract pieces of that URL. Again, you don't actually need to uh, migrate your database to start taking advantage of this. You can just cast to a URI type and then use it directly. And I'm gonna talk about these again in a moment when we talk about um, domains. Uh, but we're going to move on to a few more special purpose types because I see the time is getting short and I don't want to keep anybody too late. Uh, Postgres has a whole bunch of geometry types. They're very handy. You've got points and lines and line segments. Actually, I said they were handy. I've never used them. Has anyone used the geometry types before? Okay, a few of you. Um, they're, they're good. I've looked at the code. I've talked to people. They work reasonably well. Um, in, in my experience, point can be useful on the website. A point is, can be useful. I mean, the truth is you've got a bunch of nice functions and operators and you, they support the uh, gist indexes, which is good. And there's all these wonderful sort of ASCII art operators like this last one here, ampersand, less than, pipe. Does anyone know what that is? I think it's strictly to the left of. I can't remember though. Um, and it, you, know, you can treat these like any other data types. These are good if you have like a little bit of geometry stuff you wanna do. Uh, but they, are, they don't have pre-computed bounding boxes, and so they're much slower than the equivalent PostGIS types. They have the benefit that they're built in. PostGIS is kind of heavy, but PostGIS is really, if you are serious about doing spatial data, you need to be using PostGIS. Everybody knows this already. Um, PostGIS is impossible to summarize in a few slides, so I'm really just gonna wave my hands at it. In PostGIS, instead of having a type for every shape, you have a geometry type and a geography type the difference is that you use the geography type when the fact that the world is curved is important to you, uh, but it has support for fewer operations. And then the, both the geometry and the geography type will pre-compute bounding boxes, and then that means that when you're doing indexed queries, uh, you'll get better results faster. Uh, it's also nice that there's just one type sort of for all your data, so you're not constantly trying to figure out, like, can I compare or intersect these types? Do these operators apply on this? Uh, and then post-GIS, came out of the GIS world and really brings in a bunch of uh, spatial C libraries and all of their functionality, both raster and vector, for you to be able to do all kinds of analysis. Uh, I'm told that by people who work in this field that the Postgres GIS stuff is way better than anything any else database has in terms of being accessible and user friendly and, and good to work with. Um, so if you have things that are spatial. The disadvantage is it's not built in and when you add it to your database, it like imports just a ton of functions and makes your dumps ugly and like if you just have, you know, like a point, then you don't necessarily want to go down this road, but if you're actually working with a lot of spatial data, PostGIS. Uh, this is an example query. Um, there's lots of lots and lots of things. There are some built-in types for network addresses. Um, I will mention Rhodium Toad's IP4R type. The built-in types cover CIDR, INET, and MAC address, and I think exists because Affilius was a really big early Postgres user. So a bunch of the early Postgres hackers had a lot of uh, specifically network address-based problems, and these types supported the work they needed to do then. Uh, today, I'm told that IP4R is the solution if you have a lot of IP addresses. It's a more compact representation, and it supports uh, uh, ranges with just indexes. ISC, I'm sorry, I didn't know the history. So ISC sponsored a lot of the early network addresses. Um, today you probably also wanna look at IP4R. If you routinely operate on IP addresses, and some of us do, uh, definitely worth grabbing IP4R and taking it for a spin. Uh, even more briefly, if you're doing uh, things that involve ACT or G quite a bit, uh, you may want to take a look at post-BIS, that's the bioinformatics system. It has a bunch of 
uh, special functions and operators for people who need to compare long strings with only four letters. Um, <laughs> fixed decimal is a second quadrant project that yeah, gives ACTG. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm told that genetics are more complicated than I knew, which should surprise absolutely nobody. <laughs> fixed decimal type, uh, this is somewhere between numeric and float. Um, this is if you have, uh, if you always want the same precision numbers and you have a whole lot of them and the performance of that is important to you, that will come in handy. And then the hyperlog log is not really a type, it's kind of like TS vector, where it's more of a value that you put in a row. But uh, hyperlog log allows you to calculate uh, uh, dis estimate distinct values on a field uh, extremely quickly. And uh, so this is good if you want to basically pre-compute sessions and number of users who looked at things and so on. Um, if you need hyperlog log, it's amazing. If you don't need hyperlog log, it's pretty cool to look at the code. Okay, and we're nearly out of time, so I will have to keep burning through this. I knew I was being too ambitious. There's too many types. Domains, are people familiar with domains? Show of hands real quick. Okay, so just a few. So a domain is basically a create your own type functionality. So when you create a domain, you can constrain existing types. So the canonical example is to roll your own email type or to further constrain another type. Um, you only want to use these if the definitions will probably never change because it's a big pain if they do. Uh, so like zip code is a good example where it's unlikely that you're going to need to update your schema because there's new zip codes. Um, there are a lot of cases where this is not a great idea, like you wouldn't want to do a postal address because good luck getting every possible postal address format defined in there. Zip codes, the, the definition of a zip code doesn't change all the time. Um, here's a couple examples. So here we're implementing a terrible email type, which is just regexing the thing to see if it has an at between some other stuff. Uh, and underneath, we're actually doing something a little more useful, which is, I'm sorry it didn't wrap. Uh, we're taking that URI type from earlier and we're constraining it. Is that me squealing? Oh, okay. It's okay. Um, we're taking the, oh, I think I've lost some microphone. All right. We're taking the URI type and then we're constraining it to say, hey, does this have an HTTPS or an HTTP host? Because it's a valid URI even if it just says, you know, foo colon. But that may not actually be enough for you to want to store that in your table. So by creating a domain, you can sort of specify in a little more detail what you consider acceptable data for a type. Um, composite types. Tables are types. So when you create a table, you also create a corresponding type that has the same things. You, a type is basically a struct conceptually. Um, all the members always come together and all the members always have the same fields. Uh, you can create your own types. Here's a simple example where, you know, there's the point type. You could also just create your own 3D point type with X, Y, and Z. Uh, people often say, like, well, when would you want a composite type? Shouldn't you just make a row or a table? It's if you actually want to store that as a value and carry that around all the time. Joining up all an X, Y, and Z of a point back into every table would be inefficient and difficult to work with. Use a, dom a composite type here and you're in business. Um, to actually reference into a composite type, uh, if it comes from a table, you need to put parens around it so that Postgres knows you're talking about the type and not the table definition. Um, I use row types just as a sidebar in window expressions all the time, so I'll sort of take the two rows and pass them around together, and then later on, further down in the width expression, I'll pick up the columns I care about. Once you've created types, you can always define your own functions. The types are just there. And if you're going to define types, Consider using PLSQL or PLV8 instead of PLPGSQL because it's uh, very slow. Uh, that function implemented in PGSQL took 10 seconds to run. In PLV8, it took two seconds to run. In PLSQL, it took 370 milliseconds. And the C implementation in the email address type was 170 milliseconds to operate on my laptop over a million rows of data. So the overhead of PLPGSQL is quite high. You can also define your own operators if you really like ASCII art. Um, here I've defined the at after uh, operator for email. Uh, you could do unary or um, binary operators, and they're only ASCII art for parsing reasons. You'll notice that the operator is immediately touching email there. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I, I, I hope people have managed to keep up. I know I've covered a lot of ground. Um, 
feel free to approach me afterwards. We're missing a few types, I think, in Postgres. I've been canvassing people and just sort of noting down some of my favorite um, replies. Someone suggested a password type. A lot of people store passwords in databases. Uh, it's very easy to do wrong. Uh, a password type that has a bunch of functions that, say, do salting correctly and things like that could be a nice convenience, encapsulate some best practices, could be a fun little project. Uh, the currency type could use some work. Um, if you're looking for a project, you could pick that up. I'm thinking about doing it myself, but, you know, promises, promises. Um, I think physical units would be really nice. Um, why should we build them? Well, it's nice not to crash rovers into Mars because we just have numbers instead of actual types. So there's a lot of fields. I've used to work in science where, because different people in different areas use different units, you can be explicit about that. We do this with times. We do this with dates. We do this with a lot of other things. I think having physical units would be quite nice. Um, an image type could be interesting. I already said earlier you should put these things in S3, but you know, lots of people have good reasons to keep images in their database. Uh, having an image type that you could also then have other types render things to or pull things out of is potentially very interesting. Uh, there is actually a extension to uh, find images. Yeah, the similar image extension was a good talk from PGCon uh, in the past. But everybody right now is kind of doing their own thing with image types. There's one in PGXN already, but it's not very fleshed out. Um, if any of these interest you, I encourage you to see if anyone's implemented it before and pile on rather than starting from scratch. Um, music could be interesting, tag analysis, sound analysis, um, 3D meshes. I mean, the type system is incredibly powerful, and we're really only scratching the surface of what could be done there. All right, we made it. <laughs> I'll close with a couple of thoughts. I think data types are great. They're a huge differentiator between Postgres and other things. They can save you work, and they can make sure that you and everybody else are doing things correctly over time. Um, you don't need to change your schema to start taking advantage of them. You can get a lot of mileage out of data types just by starting working with them today as you write queries. So go experiment, have fun, and next year I hope to see at least one talk about a new data type someone wrote. Um, if you have comments, questions, or complaints, you can reach me. I would love it if you uh, give me feedback. I'm sorry, the color is bad there. Maybe if I highlight it. Um, if you go to the link and give me feedback on my talk, that would be great. Thanks very much. <laughs>